Chapter 15, The Autonomic Nervous System. One of the questions we're going to have to answer today is how nicotine can be labeled as a stimulant, and yet many smokers say that they smoke cigarettes in order to relax. We'll talk about orthostatic hypotension and why you might get dizzy or even pass out if you sit upright too quickly. We'll talk about epinephrine, which can act as a hormone in the bloodstream, and why the parasympathetic system doesn't get its own hormone. We'll talk about why your patients have problems providing you with urine samples, and we'll talk about a very popular class of drugs called beta blockers. We'll have to remember a little bit of our physiology from last quarter when we discussed muscle tone. To do all of that, we'll start by comparing the somatic versus the autonomic nervous systems, and then we'll break the autonomic nervous system up into a sympathetic and a parasympathetic branch. Then we'll learn about these one at a time. I'll start with the sympathetic and then move on to the parasympathetic nervous system. As we do so, we'll discuss neurotransmitters, chemicals released by neurons that combine to receptor proteins found on either the dendrites of other neurons or on target organs. Then we'll move on to some physiology and talk about how both of these branches can activate the same organs. And then we'll have to learn a little bit of anatomy today. Just to review, we have a number of different divisions to the nervous system. We've spent a lot of time covering the central nervous system, which was the brain and the spine. And today we're talking about the peripheral nervous system. These include all of the nerves that leave the CNS to connect to target organs. Those might be cranial nerves, or the spinal nerves. Those nerves may be going towards the CNS or away from the CNS, and it's the ones that are going away that we're going to compare today. If they control skeletal muscles, we'll call that the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls smooth muscle or cardiac muscle, and that's the one that will break up into these two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The somatic nervous system is under conscious control, meaning if we activate neurons in the pre-central gyrus, this can ultimately lead to the contraction of skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system is subconscious. Activity in the hypothalamus or medulla oblongata would activate smooth muscle or cardiac muscle. In the somatic nervous system, the connections are simple. One neuron leaves the spinal column and connects to a muscle. The autonomic nervous system was one step more complicated. One neuron leaves the CNS, we'll call that a preganglionic neuron, but it connects to a ganglion. And then a second neuron leaves that ganglion to connect to the target organ. Here's my illustration of the somatic nervous system. The first neuron has a cell body in the ventral horn. Its axon leaves the ventral root, travels down one of the two major ramuses to connect to the target organ, which is a skeletal muscle. In the autonomic nervous system, I had a preganglionic neuron in the CNS. It connects to another cell in a ganglion, and then it's the postganglionic neuron that actually connects to the target organ which will either be cardiac muscle or smooth muscle. Here's the way our textbook draws the stuff that I've just been showing you on the previous two pages. Neurons from the brain will synapse in the spinal cord. A preganglionic cell would exit the spinal cord and synapse in a ganglion, and then a postganglionic neuron would exit that ganglion to synapse on the target organ. Okay, we're going to switch comparisons now. So I just want to point out that the left and right sides of the page are no longer somatic versus autonomic. We'll now be comparing the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. If you're a word nerd, you might be interested to know that sympathetic means with suffering and parasympathetic means next to with suffering. 
Back when I learned about anatomy, the sympathetic nervous system was simply called the fight or flight response. These days, that's been upgraded to four Fs. Feeding, fleeing, fighting, and having sexual relations. The parasympathetic branch is still called the rest and digest branch, so that's easy to remember. These two systems may work independently. That's how I'm going to teach them to you, one at a time, and that may be all that you need to do. But many times they actually work together, either cooperatively or opposing one another. So after you've learned about the sympathetic and then moved on to learn about the parasympathetic, you'll have to integrate those two sections of information and make sure you think about both of them at the same time. The major neurotransmitters of the sympathetic nervous system are norepinephrine and epinephrine. The major neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine. Now we will see exceptions to this, but in general, if we're discussing epinephrine and norepinephrine, we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system. Whereas if we're talking about acetylcholine, we may be talking about the parasympathetic nervous system. There are some anatomical differences between these two branches. Covering these in lab might be more useful than here on this video. But the sympathetic nervous system originates in the thoracic and lumbar regions. That's where we find the lateral horns in the gray matter. Their ganglia are very close to the spinal cord. The sympathetic chain is just ventral and lateral to the spinal cord. The parasympathetic nervous system originates either in the brain or way down in the sacrum. Their fibers have to extend a long distance to reach ganglia close to the target organs. So the postganglionic cells have very short axons. This is the opposite of what we saw in the sympathetic nervous system, where the postganglionic neurons had to have the longer axons. Here is a list of some of the responses to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. I'm not going to read this list out to you right now, but we will be covering a number of these one at a time throughout the lecture. Here might be a good time to hit pause and review this list before we move on. Story time. Back when I learned about the autonomic nervous system, we considered the 100 million neurons found in the digestive tract to be part of the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest branch. It's much more accurate to call these their own separate structure, the enteric nervous system. These neurons can work completely independently from the brain, meaning you could cut off your head and your guts would still be able to move food through them and digest it as long as the cells remained living. So the only reason I have this slide here is if you have an older textbook that tries to teach you about the enteric nervous system in this chapter. I will be teaching you about these neurons when we learn about the digestive system, and that's not coming up until next quarter. Let's start with the sympathetic nervous system. The ganglia for the nervous system are connected into two chains on either side of the spinal cord. The preganglionic cells leave the spinal cord and travel up the rami communicantes to synapse in one of these sympathetic chain ganglia. The postganglionic fibers begin in the ganglia and would exit the sympathetic chain to connect to a target organ. One thing that's important to point out is that the lateral horns are only found in the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord, and yet the sympathetic chain extends much further than that, up to, into the head and down into the sacral region. What's more is some of the targets of these postganglionic fibers are up in the head or all the way down in the toes. So even though I've got sympathetic neurons just in the thoracic and lumbar regions, that's where they begin, they end all over the place. So I've got more sympathetic chain ganglia than I do lateral horns.
That means some of the axons have to travel further up or down the sympathetic chain and connect to very distant target organs. So some of the postganglionic fibers are very long. Some of those fibers, rather than synapsing in the sympathetic chain ganglia, will travel through the ganglia and synapse in the adrenal glands. You can think of the deepest part of the adrenals as part of the sympathetic nervous system. Only instead of releasing neurotransmitters onto a specific target, we release those same chemicals into the bloodstream and we call them hormones. But it's the same chemical, they're just behaving in a different fashion. So the sympathetic nervous system can either release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine at synapses or dump a bunch of epinephrine into the bloodstream. Keep in mind I'm simplifying here a bit. The adrenals do release some norepinephrine and we can see epinephrine released from some synapses. But in general, norepinephrine is usually used as a neurotransmitter. And when neurons release this onto a target organ, just a single target organ would be activated. So the sympathetic nervous system could activate the irises or it could activate the reproductive tract individually. When epinephrine is dumped into the bloodstream, on the other hand, pretty much the entire branch of the sympathetic nervous system is activated all at once, and all of the target organs that can respond do so. So we have two ways affecting target organs. We can do it individually with the neurotransmitter norepinephrine, or we can have a body-wide response with the hormone epinephrine. You may have noticed that I said pretty much when I was talking about the effects of epinephrine when it was dumped into the bloodstream. There are differences in how norepinephrine and epinephrine bind to the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. So when epinephrine is dumped into the bloodstream, we have pretty much every target organ responding, but not all, and not all to the same amount. For instance, when you get scared, you don't ejaculate. Otherwise, you'd watch a lot more horror movies. The reproductive tract does not respond to epinephrine nearly as strongly as it does to norepinephrine released from neurons. One major difference between the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine is time. When epinephrine is dumped into the bloodstream, it tends to stick around for an hour or so, whereas the effects of norepinephrine are measured in milliseconds because norepinephrine is quickly broken down by enzymes in the synaptic cleft. For a neuron to keep the irises dilated, for instance, would require a constant release of norepinephrine from a single synapse. Whereas if you were to get scared, a bunch of epinephrine dumped into the bloodstream could keep your irises dilated, your heart rate elevated, and your attention elevated for an hour or so. And if you're trying to fall asleep, that's a major bummer. So those are some of the basics of the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic nervous system, and a little bit of the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system. Let's discuss the neurotransmitters in a bit more detail. So far, we've skipped over the ganglia. It turns out that preganglionic neurons all release acetylcholine, whether they are preganglionic sympathetic neurons or preganglionic parasympathetic neurons. It's always acetylcholine in those ganglia. Differences arise in the postganglionic neurotransmitters. If it's the sympathetic nervous system, the postganglionic neuron typically releases norepinephrine. There are exceptions to this rule, but it's usually norepinephrine. Those exceptions include acetylcholine and nitric oxide. We will, however, be focusing on the major postganglionic neurotransmitter, norepinephrine. Both epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to a G protein coupled receptor called an adrenergic receptor. Take a look at this word. This should remind you of the word adrenaline, 
and that's where we got the adrenergic receptor name. These receptors come in two basic flavors, alpha and beta, but they all activate G proteins, which can activate intracellular enzymes like adenylate cyclase. There are multiple types of both alpha and beta receptors. This is not something that I'm going to be testing you on, but it's important to understand that there are different receptors. For this reason, different target organs can respond to epinephrine and norepinephrine differently because our responses are always based on the receptor that is present. And it's going to be pretty important to understand the difference between alpha and beta receptors when it comes to the drugs known as beta blockers. Those drugs preferentially bind to the beta receptors. But there's some important drugs that preferentially bind to the alpha receptors as well. So those are the major neurotransmitters, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Those bind to alpha or beta adrenergic receptors, and it's the receptors that will mediate the responses that our target organs have. Let's move on to the parasympathetic nervous system. Here's a more complete list of the effects of parasympathetic activity. Now would be a good time to hit pause and go over this list on your own. I'll be covering a number of these in more detail. We'll talk about the pupils and how they respond. We'll also be talking about heart rate. That will be a very important topic this term. Usually people ask me at this point, why could the parasympathetic system trigger urination when some people get scared and pee their pants? If you look at medical textbooks, you will find two major hypotheses, often with the caveat that we don't fully understand how the urinary system is controlled by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. But it is true that parasympathetic activity is what triggers urination and sympathetic activity inhibits urination. So why might some people pee their pants when they're scared? One hypothesis is that maybe they're squeezing their abdominal muscles so hard that it simply forces urine out of the bladder. The other hypothesis is that maybe the existence of multiple adrenergic receptors on the bladder could make for complicated behaviors in the bladder. A little bit of epinephrine may be triggering relaxation, but even more epinephrine triggering contraction. That's not the case, but that's actually a pattern that we see in the endocrine system quite a lot. A little bit of a hormone causing one response and even more hormone causing the opposite response. So it's not a bad guess. We do see examples of that elsewhere. It's just that the best answer is the answer that veterinarians learn about in their first year of veterinary school. Many animals will have an opposite response to stress. Rather than going into fight or flight mode, they will have what is called a vasovagal reflex. So the vagus nerve, as you may remember, is one of those big cranial nerves. And in fact, it carries a lot of parasympathetic fibers. So when these animals are scared and they know they can't fight their way out and they can't run away fast enough, they instead play dead. They activate the parasympathetic nervous system which causes a massive enough drop in blood pressure and heart rate that they pass out and appear dead, and in fact maybe even urinate and defecate over themselves, making themselves less tasty of a morsel to whatever predator might be nearby. And it turns out while this is very common for certain small animals, and vets have to be trained to approach those animals properly because you can scare them to death, some humans will have these same responses to stress. Rather than going into fight or flight mode, they will instead pass out and potentially even pee their pants. Now it's important to note before we move on that the typical response to stress is to block urination, which means that your patients are often going to have a very difficult time providing you with a urine sample. That's because they're going to be stressed out being there at the hospital 
and a little bit of sympathetic tone will actually inhibit the ability of the bladder to squeeze, meaning they may have lots of urine in their bladder, but they can't get it out very easily. Let's move on to the anatomy of the parasympathetic nervous system. If the sympathetic nervous system was highlighted in blue, the preganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic system are highlighted in red. They either come off the brain directly or they exit the sacral area of the spinal cord. So some of those cranial nerves that you learned about a week or so ago carry a number of the parasympathetic fibers, especially that vagus nerve, the one that carried the vasovagal reflex to the heart and bladder. But some preganglionic neurons also exit the sacral region of the spinal cord. And these preganglionic fibers have to travel long distances to reach distant ganglia. It's here where we find our first synapse outside of the spine. The preganglionic fiber will release acetylcholine and that will activate the postganglionic neuron, which is close to the target organ. And those postganglionic neurons also release acetylcholine onto the targets. And just like any neurotransmitter, the effects are very short-lived because there are enzymes that can break down that neurotransmitter in these synapses. So to keep the rest and digest branch going, we have to continually release acetylcholine. We've seen acetylcholine a couple of times now in this lecture. It is the neurotransmitter released by the preganglionic cells of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's the neurotransmitter used in the ganglia. However, only postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system typically release acetylcholine. Remember, the primary neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system was norepinephrine. And just like adrenergic receptors came in multiple flavors, we have multiple types of cholinergic receptors. Luckily, we've learned about both of these. So this page here should just be review. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are ligand-gated ion channels, meaning they bind to acetylcholine and open up a pore that allows sodium into the cell, depolarizing it. And this is the type of receptor that we would find on the dendrites of the postganglionic neurons of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. When those postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic nervous system release acetylcholine onto a target organ, it will bind instead to a muscarinic receptor. These are the G protein coupled receptor examples that you learned about in the first chapter. So both nicotinic and muscarinic receptors bind to acetylcholine. But it turns out there's different drugs that can mimic acetylcholine for one of those receptors or the other. And those chemicals are nicotine and muscarin. Nicotine is a chemical that can mimic acetylcholine and bind to the active site of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So it would also be able to open up those ligand gated ion channels. And we find these receptors not only in the ganglia of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, but actually throughout the entire nervous system. And one important place where we have them is in the nucleus accumbens. And for this reason, nicotine is centrally addictive. Muscarin binds to a different type of receptor. It binds to the muscarinic receptor and therefore is not addictive. These muscarinic receptors can also be found throughout the brain, but this is the type of receptor we find on most of the parasympathetic target organs. So this chemical, which is a toxin produced by this mushroom over here, will activate parasympathetic effects throughout the body. If you look at signs of muscarin toxicity, this should look very familiar to you because it's just our list of parasympathetic effects. Salivation, excessive GI tract movement, diarrhea, 
restriction of the airways, drop in blood pressure, slow heart rate. Another chemical that affects muscarinic receptors is called atropine. This one actually does the exact opposite. It blocks these receptors. It's produced by a plant called deadly nightshade or belladonna. And one of the effects of this is to block parasympathetic activity to the pupils. That's how it's used in medicine. If you've ever gotten eye drops at the eye doctor to dilate your pupils, what the eye doctor really wanted to do was activate the sympathetic nervous system. That would dilate the pupils. It just turns out that it's safer to inhibit the parasympathetic nervous system. So we'll talk a little bit more about sympathetic and parasympathetic tone coming up, and we can explain this behavior a little bit more detail. We need to first review second messenger activity. The binding of acetylcholine or muscarin to a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor will activate a G protein, which can activate enzymes like adenylate cyclase, which can make cyclic AMP, which can have all sorts of effects in the target cell. If you're one of my students here on campus, this photo should look familiar to you. It's of course a photo of Amanitis muscaria, a mushroom that grows here on campus, and it can make muscarin. Some people will eat this mushroom because it has hallucinogenic properties. But some people don't know how to get the proper dosage and they eat too much of it. And then the muscarin mimics parasympathetic activity and triggers excessive salivation and GI tract motility, which can lead to vomiting and diarrhea and require hospitalization. Luckily for us locals, this mushroom isn't very toxic. That's because it produces a little bit of muscarin but it actually produces more of a chemical called muskimol, and that's the one that has the hallucinogenic properties. There are other mushrooms that make even more muscarin, and that helps to protect the mushroom from being eaten by things like, you know, us, because it's poisonous. It triggers activation of parasympathetic effects throughout the body, which is generally not good whether you're a human or a deer. Let's review all of the different receptors that we've talked about so far, and that should really be our finalized list. The adrenergic receptors would bind to adrenaline, or as we've been calling it, epinephrine. And they came in two basic flavors, the alpha and the beta adrenergic receptors. These can be found in different target organs. And it's not important that you memorize this list but to understand that there are different adrenergic receptors in different places. The acetylcholine receptors came in two basic flavors, the nicotinic and the muscarinic. The muscarinic ones were typically associated with the parasympathetic nervous system being found on target organs, whereas the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors were found in the synapses of the ganglia of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And this was the first ligand-gated ion channel that we learned about at the beginning of this term. Now there are five different types of muscarinic receptors and I didn't even bother trying to expand this list. So muscarinic effects can be just as complicated as adrenergic effects. But that covers up the parasympathetic anatomy and the neurotransmitters found in the parasympathetic nervous system. Let's move on to talk about how these two branches can work together. Sympathetic effects are quite typically very widespread, whereas parasympathetic effects are only at specific organs. Most of our organs can receive information from both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you paid attention to those lists of sympathetic effects and parasympathetic effects, you may have noticed that they were usually the exact opposite of one another. For instance, if the sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate, the parasympathetic nervous system decreased heart rate. 
Here's an abbreviated list. I won't talk about the entire list of sympathetic and parasympathetic effects, just the ones that you see here on this page. I've already introduced the effects on the eyes very briefly, but we'll talk about the effects here again. We'll need to understand the effects of heart rate, that the sympathetic effect is to increase heart rate and the parasympathetic effect decreases heart rate. It turns out our blood vessels only have sympathetic fibers. So we either turn them on or they are turned off. But that sympathetic tone can affect blood flow to different organs. The lungs will have an opposing effect. Sympathetic leads to dilation of the bronchioles and parasympathetic to constriction of the bronchioles. Last up is the reproductive tract. This is the one place where we see the two branches working together. The sympathetic response is ejaculation, whereas the parasympathetic response is increased blood flow. And at least for men, the increased blood flow that causes an erection is generally necessary to achieve ejaculation. So we'll need both parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. But in most of these other places, sympathetic and parasympathetic opposed one another. So we would usually only see one or the other. Let's get back to this concept of dual innervation. This states that most target organs can respond to both the sympathetic branch and the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. The heart is an excellent example of this. It has beta adrenergic receptors that can bind to norepinephrine, and it has muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, which can bind to acetylcholine. When the sympathetic branch releases norepinephrine, this leads to an increase in heart rate. When the parasympathetic branch releases acetylcholine, this leads to a drop in heart rate. So our heart rate at any given time is dictated by the amount of norepinephrine compared to the amount of acetylcholine. This leads us to our next very important topic, which is autonomic tone. This is exactly the same as muscle tone that we learned about last quarter. Last quarter, we learned that when muscles were relaxed, there was actually some baseline activity. So we did not see neurons completely turned off at any given point in time. Even when a muscle was relaxed, the neurons controlling it were releasing a little bit of acetylcholine. We could always go up or down from that baseline level. The same is true for the autonomic nervous system. Both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers should be releasing small amounts of either norepinephrine or acetylcholine at all times. When I go into fight or flight mode, the neurons that are releasing norepinephrine will release even more norepinephrine, whereas the parasympathetic fibers will release less acetylcholine. So we've changed the amount of tone. We've increased sympathetic tone and decreased parasympathetic tone. But even when I'm in fight or flight mode, those parasympathetic neurons are still releasing a little bit of acetylcholine. We never turn off completely. So the heart receives dual innervation, meaning there are both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers connected to it. If I was in neither the fight or flight nor the rest and digest mode, both of these neurons would be releasing some neurotransmitter. The sympathetic neurons would be releasing a little bit of norepinephrine and the parasympathetic fibers releasing a little bit of acetylcholine. And if I was relaxed, then I would turn down the amount of norepinephrine released from the sympathetic fibers and turn up the amount of acetylcholine released from the parasympathetic fibers, thereby increasing parasympathetic tone, and this would lower my resting heart rate. If I jumped into fight or flight mode, I would flip the pattern. My sympathetic branch would suddenly release a lot more norepinephrine, and my parasympathetic branch would be releasing less acetylcholine. 
and this would lead to an accelerated heart rate. To reiterate, the neurons of the autonomic nervous system, and in fact most neurons in the nervous system altogether, are not on-off switches. Even when we typically think of them as being off, they have some baseline activity. For that reason, we can inhibit that activity even further. Beta blockers are a very commonly prescribed class of drug that helps to lower blood pressure by blocking sympathetic tone to the heart. We typically aren't in fight or flight mode all day long, and yet these drugs can work all day long. And that's because even when we are relaxed, there is a little bit of sympathetic tone. And if we turn that down even further, this can help lower heart rate a little bit more and lower blood pressure a little bit more. That would not work if the sympathetic neurons were turned off when we were relaxed. And yet beta blockers definitely have an effect even when we are relaxed. To summarize, the heart receives dual innervation. It can respond to both acetylcholine and norepinephrine. These are the neurotransmitters re released by the postganglionic fibers of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. The acetylcholine binds to muscarinic acetylcholine receptors and leads to a depressed heart rate. Norepinephrine binds to beta adrenergic receptors, which leads to an elevated heart rate. And our heart rate at any given time is determined by the amount of acetylcholine and the amount of norepinephrine. Beta blockers work by decreasing sympathetic tone. They're going to block some of those beta adrenergic receptors, decreasing the amount of norepinephrine signaling. This should increase parasympathetic tone, which leads to lower heart rate and lower blood pressure. For further review, parasympathetic fibers exited the spinal cord in the thoracic and lumbar regions. The preganglionic neurons released acetylcholine in the sympathetic chain ganglia. And the postganglionic neurons typically released norepinephrine onto the target organs. Similarly, we could also release epinephrine into the bloodstream. Epinephrine can also bind to adrenergic receptors. But this would bind to all adrenergic receptors throughout the body, all at once, leading to widespread sympathetic effects. The parasympathetic nervous system exited the brain or the spinal cord in the sacral region. The preganglionic fibers released acetylcholine, and the postganglionic fibers also released acetylcholine. But the ganglia were closer to the target organs. The parasympathetic nervous system does not get its own hormone the way that the sympathetic does. Having a hormone is useful because it can get the entire body into fight or flight mode all at once. And epinephrine lasts in the bloodstream for a lot longer than norepinephrine lasts in a synapse. Norepinephrine is broken down by enzymes very quickly, the same way that acetylcholine is broken down by enzymes very quickly. So when epinephrine is released into the bloodstream, there will be a sympathetic response that'll last for hours. This is useful for running away from saber-toothed tigers. Maybe it only takes you 20 minutes to run away from that saber-toothed tiger, but you want to remain alert and ready to run away again if that tiger finds you. So that's something that epinephrine can do. Get your whole body ready to run away from a tiger. Your brain becomes more alert, your pupils dilate so that you can see more, your heart rate and breathing rate go up so that you can exercise more, and blood flow is redirected from your digestive tract to your skeletal muscles so that you can run away faster. And even if you do succeed in running away, you're going to remain in that state for a little while longer, just in case you need to. You would never need to remain in a prolonged state of digesting. We need to be able to run away from a tiger at any time. So the parasympathetic system does not have a 
widespread, long-lasting hormone. We can jump into sympathetic tone at a moment's notice. But leaving that state can take a while. If you get really scared late at night, you may have trouble falling asleep for another hour or two until that epinephrine is completely removed from the bloodstream. Here would be a good spot to talk about the effects of nicotine. There are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the ganglia of both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. The target organs typically have muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So when somebody smokes nicotine, it'll be able to activate either one of the ganglia. The effects that nicotine will have will depend on which tone is predominating at the time. In the morning, people are typically relaxed, meaning they're in rest and digest mode. So the parasympathetic fibers are already releasing acetylcholine onto the ganglia, which will cause acetylcholine to be released onto target organs, such as the heart, and our heart rate would be low. Having the first cigarette in the morning would activate all of these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Of course, the parasympathetic ganglia are already activated, so this will have a negligible effect here, but the sympathetic ganglia would be activated, and this will increase norepinephrine release onto target organs. This will have a stimulatory effect, increasing heart rate and attention, and generally acting as a stimulant, which is how we define nicotine. So why do some people say they smoke cigarettes in order to calm down? Well, if that first cigarette in the morning had a stimulatory effect, it may actually have a calming effect later in the afternoon. When you're at work or school and you're stressed out, sympathetic tone is predominating, meaning acetylcholine is already being released in the sympathetic chain ganglia, activating the postganglionic neurons, and those are releasing norepinephrine. So when sympathetic tone is predominating, having a cigarette at this time would activate parasympathetic ganglia, which means that more acetylcholine would be released onto target organs, and this tends to have a calming effect. Now we said earlier that when there's both acetylcholine and norepinephrine released at the same time, norepinephrine predominates. But norepinephrine plus nothing is going to be a much more stimulatory effect than norepinephrine plus acetylcholine. Let me give you a metaphor. If you were in the shower and only had the hot water on, your shower is going to be a lot hotter than if you turned up the hot water and the cold water tap. And that's exactly what nicotine does in the afternoon. If people are already stressed and their sympathetic nervous system is predominating in tone, activating some parasympathetic fibers will tend to decrease that tone and have a calming effect. There were some anatomical differences to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems as well, such as where the preganglionic fibers exited the CNS and where the ganglia were located. There were some biochemical differences as well, such as the neurotransmitters released from the postganglionic neurons. And then we also talked about dual innervation. Most of our target organs could respond to both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And typically the responses were the exact opposite of one another. If for some reason both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers were firing at the same time, the effects of norepinephrine are usually stronger and they win out. But in general, we would either have elevated sympathetic tone or elevated parasympathetic tone. Next up are visceral reflexes. Our viscera are our guts, or a lot of our internal organs. We talked about somatic reflexes in the previous chapter. For instance, the stretch reflex, where we had a sensory neuron that could signal to the spine to activate a motor neuron that caused skeletal muscle contraction. It turns out smooth muscles and cardiac muscles have the same sort of reflexes 
only now they're mediated by autonomic neurons rather than somatic motor neurons. Some of these reflexes have to go through the central nervous system, either the spine or the brain. But it turns out some autonomic reflexes skip the CNS altogether and are mediated strictly by the ganglia. The names for these would be long or short reflexes. One example of such a reflex is the pupillary reflex. When bright light is shown into one eye, this is detected by light receptors, which can send this information to the brain. And this can activate parasympathetic neurons, which will connect back to the smooth muscle of both of the irises, leading to constriction of both of the pupils. This is a classic negative feedback loop. Bright light led to a reduction in the amount of light entering the eye. And in this reflex, the ipsilateral response was the same as the contralateral response. Both pupils should constrict, even if only one pupil detects very bright light. Another excellent example is the orthostatic reflex. Some people have a problem with this reflex and they have a condition called orthostatic hypotension, which is actually a large number of conditions. For these people, the reflex is not strong enough. For the rest of us, when we sit up quickly, gravity would start pooling blood down in our lower extremities, pulling it away from the brain. And if we didn't have enough blood in our brain, that could cause us to become dizzy or even pass out. So to prevent this from happening, blood pressure is detected by baroreceptors in either the aorta or the carotid body, and they send this information to the brain. When they detect a drop in blood pressure, this activates sympathetic neurons, which will release norepinephrine onto the heart, increasing heart rate. When you sit up quickly, your heart rate may go up by 10 or 15 beats per minute, and this will make sure that blood pressure in the brain remains constant and we don't pass out. Now, this reflex was mediated by neurons. We released norepinephrine onto the heart. This is not the same as releasing epinephrine into the bloodstream. When we sit up quickly, our lungs do not respond, and we certainly don't have an ejaculation event either. We have specific neurons for mediating specific responses. So we just activated the sympathetic neurons connected to the heart, not the ones connected to the lungs or to the genitalia. So those are the autonomic reflexes. We had both short and long ones. That was an important concept to understand. And then we covered two specific long reflexes, the pupillary reflex and orthostatic hypotension, which was a deficiency in the orthostatic reflex. But that should wrap up the chapter for today.